I am Matthew Jenkins Yereshevitz, music director designate of the Canton Symphony Orchestra. And I'm Rachel Hagemeyer, president and CEO. This is Orchestrating Change. We are joined today by soprano Amanda Powell, a multifaceted artist equally at home under the lights on the orchestral concert stage and in the intimate clubs of the jazz and folk scenes. She has performed with the Cleveland-based Grammy Award-winning ensemble Apollo's Fire and has been featured as a soloist on a number of staples of the Baroque repertoire. Additionally, she is the lead singer of the group Alla Bora, which performs modern jazz arrangements of traditional Italian folk songs. Amanda also teaches voice at Cleveland State University and serves as community arts liaison for the Cultural Arts Center at Disciples Church in Cleveland Heights. We are thrilled to welcome Amanda to the Canton Symphony Orchestra twice this season as our soprano soloist for Mozart's Requiem and with Alla Bora as part of our Divergent Sound series. But first, we are delighted to welcome her here to our podcast. Amanda Powell, welcome to Orchestrating Change. Wow, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here with you. I am so excited to have you. Um, You're now the second, before this season, we had never had um, guests from our Divergent Sounds series on the podcast. Um, and now you're our second one this season from Divergent Sounds. And wow. uh, they've made some really great episodes. John P's episode was so much fun. We had a great time recording it. So we're so excited to get to know you more. Um, I know Matthew knows you a little bit. He's He's had the pleasure of getting to know your work at least and has heard lots of great things about you. So would you mind just introducing yourself so we can get to know you a little bit better. Where'd you grow up? How did music become a part of your life? All that good stuff. Yes, delighted to. Um, so I grew up, I was born outside of Washington, DC, and I lived in the metropolitan area, both on the Maryland and Virginia side, um, and went to Shenandoah Conservatory, which is also in Virginia. So I kind of identify as an East Coaster, although I've now lived in Cleveland longer than I've lived anywhere else since we moved around quite a bit growing up. Um, I came from a family that loved music, respected music, but were not musicians. Um, And so I found my way to the piano when I was little. And my mom found someone who was a student at the University of Maryland who would teach me piano before I could, I couldn't read yet. And so none of the teachers wanted to to teach me piano. And so I began um, learning piano just as something to do. I think my mom described me being a very um, energetic child and she said I needed something to do. And we had a piano, so she put me in piano lessons. and that became a huge part of my growing up. Uh, so I grew up as a pianist. I would always accompany the choirs in middle school and high school and secretly want to be a singer deep down in my soul. Um, but a life of asthma and coughing and being a sick kid um, led me to have a really raspy and um, sort of dysfunctional voice. And so it wasn't until I I got ready to go to college and I was just like, I have to do music. Music is so much a part of what I want to do in my in my work. Um, and I went to my piano teacher at the time and, and I said, I'm going to audition for music school. And she said, you do not like piano enough to go to college for it. <laughs> and she said, I know that you love singing because by that time I had t- uh, started singing in the choirs in high school. And she said, you need to go get a voice teacher and audition to go to school for voice because you love that. And that is what I did. And so um, beyond piano growing up, um, I had grandparents who were really into folk music. And so I sang a lot of Appalachian folk music being in that region. Um, And my mom's dad comes from Romania. So there was a lot of like gypsy sounds and Middle Eastern and um, Eastern European sounds in music that I was hearing. Um, And I started singing jazz because I played piano and I had this raspy, husky voice. And so (laughs) everyone told me, you have to sing jazz. Um, And so, and I ended up loving particularly the improvisational component that um, was found in jazz. And so that is a snapshot as best as I can give of my, my life growing up. 
That is wonderful. And I, you know, I relate to so much of that. I grew up in a family that was not musical, but appreciated music. And I played the saxophone as my instrument in school and uh, all through college and improvised as well. And I, I find it's something that sadly, not enough people on the classical side of things have experience with. Not enough people have used their brain that way. But I think it's just been such a wonderful part of my musical experience. And I love the, the fact that I've had that component. And one style, of course, that other than jazz, that is known for its very improvisatory nature is Baroque music. So you have really found a home as a Baroque soloist and uh, as a performer with Apollo's Fire, among many, many others. How did all of this, uh, how did you find your way to Baroque music as a big part of your musical life? I was always drawn to early music aesthetics. Like I, I didn't really know that that's what I was drawn to, but um, I remember listening to Bach on NPR on the radio um, and just thinking that there was something really magical about the way I was invited into the sound and the music. I remember particularly listening to oboe concertos of Bach and just being completely blown away. Um, and honestly, in college, because it's not a very typical thing in a lot of undergrad programs, although it's more spoken about now, but when I was in undergrad, they, they didn't talk a lot about like early music versus, you know, bel canto opera. It was all just like, if you were a voice performance major, you were an opera major. Um, and having transli transitioned very quickly from piano to all of a sudden being a voice major, um, I didn't even really know what it meant to be a voice major. Um, kind of ignorantly, I was like, well, I sing folk music and I like to sing jazz and I'm kind of learning about classical music. So I'm just going to be doing all of those things in college. And I learned very quickly that it was actually just a very thin slice, that it was just more about um, art song and opera study. study. And um, it really, I, I liked it. I liked my experience in that world, but it really didn't, um, it didn't do it for me in the way that I, I really love community building and um, sort of connection with audiences. Um, and the very last semester, of my senior year, the choir conductor, Robert Schaefer, who is an amazing conductor and composer, he handed me a piece by Monteverdi. And he said, we're gonna go on tour in Europe and I am gonna, you and I are gonna do this as a duet. I'm gonna play this on the organ and you're gonna sing this piece. And I had never heard Monteverdi in all of those years of studying, four years of studying, you know, music and music history, I hadn't ever really taken in the music of Monteverdi and I listened and it had these amazing sounds and this, like you could feel the, you know, the depth, you could feel the emotion. And I was completely just on fire at that point. And so we performed, um, he gave me Negro Sum from the Vespers, which is actually not, it's traditionally sung by a tenor. At that time I was singing um, mezzo. so. I sang it an octave higher and um, we sang that together in many cathedrals all over Europe. And that began my interest in what, what is early, what is this thing, this Baroque and earlier music that invites people to really feel their feelings, tell their stories, and even use their voice to improvise in certain ways to tell those stories that I wasn't finding in the same way in like bel canto opera. Um, so that was the, the door opening for me. And then coming to Cleveland where a world-class ensemble such as Apollo's Fire is and getting the opportunity to work with them um, really just expanded my experience and, and repertoire in that regard. I have a question to follow up. Just going back to your college years, you mentioned playing the piano, you mentioned singing in choir. You never mentioned doing theater or musicals or anything like that. Was doing opera in college the first time you ever had to put a costume on and, and perform a, a role, a dramatic role? And was, was that like, oh, this is so not my element here. I, I'd rather <laughs> sing Baroque concert music. I had done some plays and musicals in high school. I went to uh, Centerville High School in Fairfax County and they have they have 
And I think, I think they still do. They had a robust music program there. And so I had the opportunity to be in a number of different musicals, but not never as a lead character. Again, I was sort of like on the fringe. I was accompanying and things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess growing up as a child, like I took some theater camps and did some like drama workshops and things. So I, I guess I had a costume on, but no, my first role, um, my freshman year, they did the barter bride and I was in the chorus and I had, they like dressed me up and, you know, I, I was young. I went to the college at 17. They like, you know, so they, they used that youth and they like put pigtails and made me like a small child. And then my sophomore year, I was playing Hansel and Hansel and Gretel. And it was kind of shocking <laughs> to go from thinking that I was going to go to college to be a singer of all these different genres to then studying like very specifically like pants roles and that was quickly followed by carabino and i you know so i played a lot of pants roles as a mezzo at that time um because i was still learning how to sing and my voice was still pretty damaged from from you know being sick uh with asthma as a child so yeah it was kind of a shock but it, it also felt really good and really natural the part that i that didn't resonate with me as much like in per your question about like do i like did i like baroque concert music more the part that didn't resonate as much is that I really, really love community. And I often say to people like, if I lost my voice and I lost my hands, I think in my work, I would still be called to create community. Um, and I don't know, it just happens that I, that I work to do that with my voice and with the music that I lead. But I would hope that if those things were lost, that I would still find ways to um, invite people into music, to educate, to connect, to invite people into their deepest musical selves um, through my education work. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, there's, okay, so I have like, I have the questions that I wrote and then like five follow-up questions I thought of just now. Um, but w one thing is that we haven't talked to a lot of singers on this podcast. Uh, I think a lot of people think that pe vocalists, it's, uh, it's not as hard. Everyone, you know, you just think there's a lot going on and there's so much to getting a degree in voice or not to, you know, you can have a really focused track to study voice that is going to be very different than someone else's experience. You know, I'm thinking of my, our, our colleagues who are, who were vocal performance majors and how different that looks at each institution. If you're talking to someone who went to the Oberlin conservatory, they're going to have kind of an early music. Oberlin has a lot of really good early music study happening while, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, I went to Baldwin Wallace university, obviously huge musical theater background there, but also a really great opera program, but much more the traditional types of opera really not di diving into anything that's going to be early music related. And I don't think people realize how much diversity there is in what we call opera. You know, we, we talk a lot right about like um, when people say classical music, they mean orchestral music. Mm -hmm. Classical music was a very specific time. Or at and, least they mean, they mean Western they, art they, they music. mean Western art music and they don't, they're, it's, it's a broad term that actually is much more specific in what it actually means. When people think mm -hmm. opera, they're probably thinking, you know, Verdi, Verdi. <laughs> and, and yeah. they're not really expanded. So I wonder if you might, I know we can't, we can't talk about, this is all the things that voice have to offer, right? O obviously, but could you maybe give people a little bit of a snapshot into the amount of diversity that really does exist in vocal performance um, in a more in the more operatic setting and what people are going to think of when they think of soloists coming to be with an orchestra or working with Apollo's fire um, because obviously we're going to talk a lot about about all the other types of voice that exists too and we had a rapper last you know there's there's so much out, out here but could you maybe just give us a little bit of a glimpse of kind of the diversity that exists if someone says hey I got a vocal performance degree what that could actually mean it can mean so many things and and yet like i so shenandoah conservatory was great and it was a great place for me to go and do my degree but i will say that halfway through i felt like i was in such a small box with art song opera the op opera focus that i went and auditioned and got into new england conservatory for jazz and when i looked at the program side by side i realized it was just another small box and I didn't want to go from one box to another box. I wanted to expand. And so I, 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 yes, 
all voice performance programs are slightly different and they have it has a lot to do with who's on faculty and what the passions are that those folks bring and the expertise that they bring in in different fields um some voice performance programs are really focused on like the pedagogy of singing and studying the instrument some don't talk about that at all um some voice performance programs have an early music emphasis because of who's on faculty or because there's a history of like a Bach festival at baldwin wallace um I was I did art and artist in residency just in the fall with Baldwin Wallace. Oh, amazing. Actually. Yay. I was actually with the wind ensemble because um, really? Dr. Brendan Caldwell yes. and Dr. Clint Needham yep. are, you know, Clint Brendan had the vision to compose a piece mm -hmm. that I would that I would use all of these different vocal colors and that we would invite some talk and conversation about improvisation for classical instrumentalists. I love that. Um, so like back to your point about like playing the saxophone and like growing up doing that, most other instrumentalists who are performing in a classical, you know, Western setting are not improvising. So I got to spend a bunch of time with Baldwin Wallace students. They were amazing, amazing. and talk about improvisation and doing this incredible thing. Um, I didn't even get to meet any of the vocalists while I was there. And so I was like really curious, like, what are your, what's your voice? you know, pr program like here. And, um, and so, you know, hopefully I'll get to do that. At some well, point, you but can meet a alum. Our manager of education is a vocal performance alum of, of Baldwin oh, Wallace. Fun. So <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you get your different focuses and they're both, they're mostly based on, um, who the teachers are and what expertise they bring. And then also even what's in the area, right? So if you're, if you're in New York City, you might have some schools that are focused more on opera because of the Metropolitan Opera. You might have some schools that are focused more on jazz because there's a lot of jazz happening. Um, but my dream, my dream for a someday voice performance program somewhere um, is that we are allowed and, in, and empowered to explore many different kinds of music. I visited about eight years ago a really, really high level classical voice conservatory and I went there about a week after Renee Fleming had been there and she had given an amazing masterclass and like all the students were, you know, thinking about opera and different ways to have careers. And so I'm coming in the next week and I'm like this 30 something year old nothing. And I'm just feeling like, oh my gosh, they had Renee Fleming last week and now they have me. And what happened was that like, I actually just, instead of trying to like pretend that I was an expert in something, which I'm not, I, I do many different things. I said, I do many different things. I don't fit into any box. I love improvisation. And I taught them some songs from Kenya. And like, I have these like classical opera singers, they were like crying and they were coming up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, you're speaking my language. Like, I don't think I'm gonna go to the Met and I don't want to and, and that's, and, but no one says that that's okay. And, and I realized that there's this huge need for conversation for vocalists, but also all musicians about like being a wholehearted full musician and not having to hide these parts of ourselves when i was in undergrad i got shamed and talked like i got talking to's for going and singing with the jazz ensemble they were like you're gonna ruin your voice you're not gonna have maintain your technique and it's my joy now to teach my students and to teach adult professionals who have you know 12 vocal degrees come to me and say, I don't know who I am as a singer. I don't even think I like singing anymore. Help. And I'm like, yes, this is what I do. I <laughs> I love every part of that so much. I mean, I just a little glimpse into me. I I grew up um, born in Kansas, raised in Oklahoma. Uh, grew up most of my musical background is the bluegrass tradition. So I I um I grew up at music festivals. I happened to have a bassoon performance degree, but I was first introduced to the bassoon at a bluegrass festival with a woman jamming around a campfire with a bunch of other people just playing. A bassoon? Yeah, she was playing bassoon. They were playing the song Falling Slowly from the Musical Once at a bluegrass festival with a bassoon around a campfire. Yeah, it's truly like when we talk about like not letting your your box, boxes happen, I... I'd never seen a bassoon before and I went, what is this thing? I'm going to do this now for the rest of my life. And then I later learned it was a classical instrument. And then yeah. I later learned, I'm like, oh, this is a very old classical instrument. Let's go back to uh, Vivaldi and all of these amazing bassoon concertos that exist in the Baroque tradition where you can go yeah. just ham on the bassoon and do really fun things. A lot of improv there. So I grew up kind of, I grew up with improv on the bassoon as a part of my kind of musical uh, tradition. And then I went to a concert, I went to Baldwin Wallace Conservatory to get a performance degree. And I had a great time. 
Um, but my professor, Jonathan Sherwin, who is the contrabassoonist for the Cleveland Orchestra, he never, he, he liked that I didn't want to be, um, I, I never wanted to be a performance, ma- a performer. That was never my goal. I wanted to be good at bassoon, but I wanted to work in admin, which is what I do now. And he, he loved that. And so he was like, let's find fun ways to play the bassoon and let's, let's program the weirdest senior recital we've ever seen that has multimedia. And I had a full bluegrass band on my senior recital, like, you know, so much fun stuff. And so you're talking about all of this and on your website, you talk about uh, the crossroads of genre. Um, And I, and I love, I love that phrase. And I love thinking about all of these different musical traditions and how they can come together and where you're from and how, uh, you know, having that Appalachian tradition mixed with everything else. So we've talked a little bit about like crossroads of genre. What, when you're talking to people and they're like, I don't, I don't even know if I like to sing anymore or or you're going to these students and you're like, let's sing songs from Kenya. What does it really mean about crossroads of genre and how can us thinking about really having these crossroads of genre make our art form better like how is it how is it going to help what we do as orchestral professionals or whatever type of music professionals to think about things outside of these boxes of genre yeah well the first thing i want to tell you rachel is that i i once did a concert with eight bassoons oh my gosh just me and eight (laughs) bassoons (laughs) what how did wait (laughs) It was the men who don't bite bassoon quartet and like their graduate students. Oh my you know, gosh. Like, so um I probably have a recording somewhere. That's so I have to see that recording of me. <laughs> oh my god, I love that so much. Um I feel like everything um in beautiful ways and in challenging ways in our in our culture is becoming in our world is becoming more fluid. Um, we have we're we're opening our hearts and opening ourselves to the idea that things are not just black and white or good or bad or right or wrong. Um, we're seeing that across every area of society, and music is reflecting that. And whereas twenty years ago I was an outlier, and Mm, if there were if I was doing a gig where there were all Baroque singers and they all knew each other because that's all that they did they were wonderful and wonderful colleagues but I didn't really know any of them because I never didn't live in that world only I would kind of come into that world and then go into the jazz world and go into the other world and I really shamed myself and struggled and I felt like well I guess I'm not authentic I guess I'm not an authentic presence in any of these areas because I'm not like all these other people who have like every early music thing on their resume and that's what they're doing and they walked this particular path. And so I just felt like a phony um, until I'm 42 and until I got to be around 35, 36 and I started kind of just trying to accept who I was as we all go through these journeys of like, oh, wait, who am I? And I, you know, I'm a mom. So I want to like model that for my daughters and I started to finally be like, you know what? I don't have to wear my Baroque hat and then my jazz hat and then my folk hat. I can actually just like wear them all or wear none of them and just be a whole artist. And so when I talk about crossroads of genres, I realized around that time that that that, that was the easiest way for me to explain because it kind of like has this visual image for me of like like all these paths coming to this sort of place where they intersect it was the easiest way for me to describe where i'm actually most comfortable um i'm so excited to sing the mozart requiem with the canton symphony orchestra and i have sung the mozart requiem before and i'm so excited to sing it again and i i've studied it deeply and i'm so excited but like if you were like amanda are you like a mozart requiem expert i'd say like no like i didn't do my doc i didn't do a doctoral thesis on it um but even in something like the Mozart Requiem that I'm not doing a lot of improvisation, that I'm not bringing a lot of like outs, I'm, I'm pretty much giving a, give, singing what Mozart gave us. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be able to tell those stories from a, from a lens of my own experience. And that's what excites me the most. No, the idea of that, no more are we recreating or having, you know, having to be a specific way in a certain way and do this thing. Um, for it to be good that we can actually ask ourselves the deeper questions of like here's the really high artistic level that i'm aspiring to and then can i invite that to be in in 
companionship with you know, what I love and what I bring to the table and all these other experiences that I have. And so with my students, I think you said something about like, how do you get there? Or how do you uncover? I, I have a student that had a 30 year operatic career, like highly successful in Europe. And they came to me because they're like, I, I feel like I don't know how to just sing. Like I only know how to like perform. And we worked at it and we worked at it and I came in through all these different doorways. And finally I said, you have children. What did you used to sing to your children when they were babies? And this person who had this gorgeous operatic voice, all of a sudden, without even thinking, went like, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. And I was like, that is where we begin. That is where we begin this conversation. And he looked at me shocked, like, what just happened? And I'm like, that is your voice. The beautiful opera voice that you, that you used for all those years to have a career, it's not serving you now. So we go back to our roots. And so th I'm, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in looking at the crossroads of genre. I'm also looking very, very interested in looking at the crossroads of our lives and how our art you know, comes in and comes out and different, we need to use different parts of our voices or our music in different ways. I'm also interested in the crossroads of the technical artistry at the highest level with the emotional story. So what that's I a, love so, cool. so much <laughs> about what you just said is uh, it highlights to me why classical music as a living art form is so important today and why going to a live performance, even if the piece is over 200 years old, as the Mozart Requiem is, even if that is the case, the artists who are performing it at any given time today are always going to bring themselves as artists. And even if they're singing the same notes, like no, every soprano that sings the solo part of the Mozart Requiem is going to come at it from a different personal life perspective and everything and bring their own art, artistry. And it's, it's why we keep going to live oh. performances because if Amen. they were all the same, if a robot orchestra just played some Berlin Philharmonic with Simon Rattle recording, then nobody would go. And that and to he, me is the yeah. beauty, the, the highest beauty of a live performance, especially today. It's, it's so, it's so fantastic how you just said that. And, and unfortunately not everybody who is making music or art is, is holding that at the core. Like right, a lot yeah. of our, a lot of our young people, they think that they have to be like perfect mm -hmm. or robotic and they come and they're like, they've been taught or they've inferred, they've heard that like, if they're not like perfect, that they're going to not be able to do this. And so I'm in a way, I feel like when I'm teaching, I teach at Cleveland State or I'm teaching my adult professional students, I feel like I'm moving against the stream of what some people are like, you know, what the culture and some, some, you know, institutions put out there, like, it has to be perfect. It has to be like, and I'm like, I would so much rather hear an imperfect, gorgeously stated, intentional singing. And with the Mozart Requiem, the soprano a couple of times serves the role of the, the light cutting through the darkness. And that's what I've been thinking a lot about as I've been preparing for this next weekend. Like, okay, so the light coming into the darkness for me means one thing. For someone else, it means something different. And for communities of people, like people in the Middle East right now who are, you know, don't have enough to eat or who are living in terrible chaos and war, light coming into the darkness means something different for them. So how do I take that like sort of big universal knowledge, mix it with my own experience of light coming into the darkness and then channel it through Mozart's gorgeous lines. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I wonder, oh gosh, I have, <laughs> ah, Amanda, I want you to come back. I want you to come in person and do a talk with people here in Canton um, at some point. I, I will email you at some point this summer. It would but, be my great pleasure. I love this. Because I love this. This is the type of stuff that I've, I, 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 I didn't want to be a performer because I didn't want to get to a place where it felt like a job. Um, yeah. and I know so many musicians who, who 
feel like I'm just reproducing this thing. It is my product. And I, this is, this is my, this is my nine to five thing. And it it starts to feel burdensome and how, how heartbreaking that what we're talking about, this community building and this bringing, breathing life into something that's over 200 years old and adding your own perspective. How do we, how do we free our musicians of today and our young people coming into this field to, and how do we, as institutions, when we are hiring musicians and have contract players, how do we, how do we talk? And this is a question, you know, we could think about here at the symphony of how do we encourage our musicians to breathe life into what they're doing? And how do you, like you as a conductor tell like, Hey friends, this is, we're collective storytelling right now. Like I'm waving my arms and I do need you to come in at a certain time, but like, (laughs) but how do we do this collectively together and have these conversations even outside the classroom when we're music making in our orchestral settings? Cause I feel like orchestral settings can turn into places where creativity is lost and mm-hmm. it can be really hard for these musicians who are just coming in, doing the job and leaving because that's mm-hmm. what it's turned into. And I don't really mm-hmm. have a question there, or like, I thought, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just so, it's heartbreaking for me to think about this beautiful thing that we get to do being uh, a burden for someone, you know? Mm. My experience uh, from as, as a conductor is when I started conducting I had no training. I started as a freshman in college completely on a whim. I got a a crazy opportunity that they, for whatever reason, handed a 19-year-old with no experience the keys to a fully staged Gilbert and Sullivan operetta with orchestra. Um, That makes sense. That's good. I I mean, you were supposed to. Well, I, I just took it and ran with it, but I had no idea what I was doing, so I could just... I could, I was creative with it because I didn't know that it was not okay not to be. And then in conservatory, I went, I didn't go to a conservatory undergrad, but I got my master's degree at a conservatory and I couldn't be here today without that. But then it took me years to stop worrying so much about doing it right all the time, or this is... Exactly, it has to be exactly this way and only this or way. Not re- took, just reproducing someone else's recording that you've heard. Not or, even yeah. reproducing a recording, but it's like these are the rules. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, you've yeah, yeah. learned, you have absorbed the rules of how it all has to be done. And it took me a while to be like, you know what? Let me take my refined technique that I took from my master's degree, and but also remember the creativity that I. Yeah came into conducting with all these years ago and put the two together. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the language that I've landed on for that with myself and with my students is um, let's get curious about that. So like a student will come to me and be like, well, I'm supposed to do it like this and it's supposed to be like that. And I'll be like, well, let's get curious about that. Let's ask some questions about that. Why is it that way? Uh, Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. So why do you think this? Okay. And I do that for myself too. Like, when I start getting into that mindset of like, oh man, but I know it's supposed to, supposed to, and should, should, should. Again, we have such a linear language even. Like I've traveled a lot in the world and I don't speak all the languages, but when I've been working with translators and trying to convey messages, I remember I was in China and I, I was trying to explain to somebody that I was a singer and it, I was in this rural place and, and the, the translator kind of looked at me and I was like, yeah, I'm a singer. That's what I do for my for my work. And they were like, okay, that's kind of like synonymous with human, right? Like we all are human. We all mm. sing. We all make art. Like it was hard. It was kind of mind blowing at that time for that person to like translate that. I said China, but it was actually in Cambodia. Um, I was in, in Cambodia when that happened. And so um, that kind of like shook me up a little bit. I was like, oh, I'm like defining myself as a singer and in like other language contexts and other cultural contexts, it's kind of like, well, yeah, you're a singer that's synonymous with being a human. Like you didn't have to tell us that. (laughs) And so even then I get curious. I'm like, okay, like I, I, I tell my students all the time, like talk out loud to yourself. Like, I'm like, Amanda, let's get curious about that thought. Let's just, let's investigate that. I I absolutely, I have a, I have a, 
I teach, I teach privately. I teach bassoon and I have a a student. We had a lesson yesterday. We spent a good 25 minutes talking about his tone and me trying to get him to describe how he was sounding. And he was like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. And I was like, we got to come up with words. Just start throwing words out. What do we feel? How does it feel to you? What, what do we like about it? What do you wish was yeah. different? How do you want to actually sound? And finally we got to a place where he's like, okay. And I was like, so, so what are some words that we use to describe sound? He's like, well, it's also like, it's like visual words. I'm like, yeah, you can use visual words to describe yeah. sound. I know you can't see sound, but you can say it, or you can use feel like you can say it sounds happy. You can say it sounds warm. You can say it sounds yeah. dark. You could say it sounds, and then we defined what the word resonant meant versus, and then he was like, well, I feel like I'm buzzy. And I'm like, welcome to the bassoon. We're a little buzzy over here, but we can get rid of a little bit of the buzzy and become more resonant. How do we think buzzy and resonant are different? We spent fully 25 minutes of his lesson just talking about his tone and we played like one scale the whole time um but by the end of it his assignment was i need you to listen to yourself i need you to actively listen to you and how you're feeling when you're playing music so that you know what you want out of it and you can ask yourself questions and you can make informed decisions because right now i don't think you're listening to yourself i don't think you're Mm -hmm. allowing yourself to listen to who you are and he just looked at me with really big eyes (laughs) and i was like you got this he was like this is a lot and i was like i know it's a lot welcome to the rest of your life this you also have to you have to i was like you have to also actively listen to yourself when you know like talking and having life with other people but that's a whole other thing too but it's just so excellent interesting. teacher. Like, oh, thanks. I'm really, I'm compelled by that because I think that a lot of teachers don't do that. I think a lot of teachers are like, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. Yeah. And it kind of messes us up. Yeah. Well, I had <laughs> um, a great, I had a great teacher, Dr. Lori Wooden at the University of Central Oklahoma. She was my bassoon teacher and we would always start every piece of music by her saying, okay, tell me the story. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the, what are you imagining? And then we'd come up with a silly story about a king walking down a hallway and then tripping over something. And we made like a whole thing. And, mm-hmm. and she's like, okay, so how do we know, how do we make that happen? If that's the story you want to tell, how do we make that happen? And like, that's how we would start every single new solo I would start. So I've kind of always taken that and run with it, which is fun. But yeah, I love, this is like one of my favorite things to talk about. I'm so glad we're talking about this. This is so exciting. <laughs> Me too. I, ju- I just want to go back for a moment to your experience in Cambodia. Amazing. And I, I, mean, I language. How cool. I had an experience in India. I went there for a friend's wedding. A college friend had an Indian wedding in New Delhi. And I remember remarking to one of the other Americans there, isn't it incredible that no matter where you go on this earth, every human culture sings. And that memory of of having that realization, that beautiful realization. I I recalled that when you were saying, I mean, I didn't know that basically in the, the Cambodian language, the word for singer and human so cool. are synonymous. That mm-hmm. that or or similar and related mm-hmm. at least. That is incredible. But it it called to mind a, a real human experience I had in, in having that realization. When I went to Cambodia, I, I, I went over all over Southeast Asia during that trip. I was doing like a kind of like a music exchange with college students and we were singing in 13 different languages. And we ended in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia and ended up spending, a, we had an extra week there because our visa back wasn't set <laughs> through China. And so we went to the Gobi Desert and we like hung out with nomadic farmers and sang with them and they sang for us. And it was just like life changing. And that was all happening between sophomore and junior year of conservatory. <laughs> and so I have wow. these two really extreme experiences. And I, I, it's kind of like a documentary movie. Like I can see it in my brain. Like I came back after that summer. It started with a European tour and then I was in Asia for the rest of the summer and it came back and then I was like in the practice rooms by myself practicing. And I have this like lens of just me being like, <sighs> I was just with farmers around the fire in the Gobi desert and we were singing music and sharing stories through our, you know, gestures. And now I'm by myself in the practice room. And even though I want to talk about how valuable it is to, to practice and it, it takes tremendous amount of time and practice and we all have to do it to continue to grow in our craft 
for me, I miss the people. <laughs> I wanted to be with people and I wanted to engage with and, and hear from and learn from other people. And so my career now has really had that at the core. And that's what I continue to, to lean towards because that's the thing that excites me the most. Amazing. So this has just been such an incredible conversation so far. But before we go too much too much longer uh, without bringing this up, let's talk a little bit about Alabora. Alabora. <laughs> because yeah. I am certainly curious about this, and I'm sure many of our listeners, especially those who are local, are going to be curious to come hear you and hear your yes. ensemble. So how did this group get started and how did you become a part of it? And what is it like? Just tell us a little bit about it. Oh, I'm just so delighted to tell you all about it because everything that I've been talking about leads up to this project. Um, it's been one of the most joyful projects that I've, and I've had a chance to work on a lot of joyful projects, but um, my good friend, composer and percussionist, Anthony Taddeo, he's Italian American, and he grew up um, not knowing much about his Italian cultural folk music. And so when he went to the new school in New York City, he um, he had a world music class and they asked him to do a paper on some folk tradition and he picked Italy and it just completely blew his mind because he found all of this music and he found particularly these recordings by Alan Lomax. Alan Lomax was a, an American ethnomusicologist who's known for his collections of Appalachian folk songs. So I knew him in that regard. I mean, he brought Jean Ritchie and her family and she's a wonderful mountain dulcimer player and singer to the light of, you know, our, to our ears and he brought so many other so many other you know folk traditions of Appalachia to us but he also spent six months in Italy and he did over 300 hours of recordings um, through the folkways uh, program of the Library of Congress and so Anthony found these this 11 disc set and when he went and did his master's degree at Youngstown State um, with Dave Morgan composition teacher he decided through Dave's encouragement, um, with Dave, Dave's encouragement, that he wanted to create arrangements for a small ensemble of many of these folk songs. And so they gave him a student ensemble and he wrote for two years. And then he transitioned that into um, the what he calls the professional group. And he, he was talking to me and like hinting about this project for many years um, in different contexts. We would be playing together in Baroque music or we would do a jazz gig together or something. And he called me up and just said, you know, I want you to do this project with me. And I wasn't skeptical. I was just busy and I have, you know, kids. And, and so it took a minute for me to really understand the bigness if that could be a word in this context of what he was seeking to do. And so what it's become is it's we're a six piece group and we have uh, what we're bringing to Canton is just our trio. We perform in different ways. We have trio, quartet, quintet, sextet. We're coming as a trio. So it's percussion, guitar and voice. And these incredible songs of love and loss and work songs that they would sing in the field or down in the sulfur mines uh, are brought to life in this way that involves classical sounds, um, tr you know, traditional classical sounds, Baroque sounds, jazz. There's a ton of improvisation, but not just like scat improvisation, like indigenous improvisation. So what you were saying, all humans everywhere sing, like channeling the kinds of styles of improvisation found in these different regions. Um, and we've just kind of seen that over the past two years that we've been touring, People come, this is what we hear all the time. I didn't know what to expect. It was so much better than I expected. I felt like I was a part of something. I rem it reminded me of my own culture's music or of grandma in Italy. It reminded me of grandma singing. People, because we're not just saying Italian music, that's it. We're saying, here's a lens by which to hear this Italian music. We're gonna tell you stories. Sometimes we do. Um, we project photos from the Alan Lomax archives, like the actual artist that he was recording. Um, Anthony weaves into some of the compositions, the actual field recordings. So I'm singing alongside of these people that were making this music. Um, and people just feel like there's this common humanity, I think, 
Um, we make sure that we tell them what the songs are about, um, even though I'm singing in a lot of dialects from the Italian continent. Um, and it's just been, for me, I get to show up as my whole self. And I don't get to do that in a lot of places. I get to be storyteller, classical singer. We do side by sides where I'll sing like what the women were singing in the tobacco fields during the time that Barbara Strozzi was composing like beautiful songs for the stage of the upper echelon of society in Italy. So we'll do like this tribute to women of two different parts of society. And it's, I get to bring my improv, like Anthony will just like say, we're going to start this piece. It's in five. Cause everything of course is he's the, he's a percussionist. So everything is in really interesting meter and it's, but it's still really accessible. And I'll be like, okay, you're going to like just improvise over five in this like, sort of you know middle eastern sounding mode because this region of italy will you know we'll do our research it was really heavily influenced by you know this middle eastern sound and so i get to like research that and take that you know and so it's just um it's very life-giving and uh and that's a little bit about ala boata that's so exciting i love that and you know i i love the the just the whole concept and the whole project I think one of one of my gateway drugs into like truly loving classical music was and still is British music of the mm-hmm. early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And name the two very famous British composers, Gustav Holst and Rafe Vaughan Williams, yes. went around the English countryside with a an Edison phonograph. Yes and recorded folk music and then incorporated it into concert hall music. Yeah. And I just, I love that they realized what an important thing it was to preserve, one, preserve, two, get down on paper, and three, make accessible and introduce to a wide, wide audience. Mm-hmm. And I just love that that you guys are doing that and doing it with music that never before has seen this kind of treatment. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what an incredible project. And now I am even more excited to <laughs> yeah. see you guys when you are when you come to the Canton Symphony. It'll be great. I, I, and I, 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 what's what's so funny about about having you all on the Divergent Sound Series is that it's actually a little weird for the Divergent Sound Series because typically our Divergent Sound Series is here is an artist who is in a very particular genre and we're adding orchestral music. We're adding orchestral musicians to it. We're going to take four members of the symphony and we're going to add that sound in. And you all already have that at the core of what you do. Um, <laughs> really, you are the Divergent Sound Series like as a, as a group. <laughs> I and, love that. Well, re- really. And so Anthony was here. He did percussion for Bethany Joy last year. Yeah. 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 He yeah. was, he, he, he did percussion for Bethany Joy and I talked to him and then I talked to him and then I was like, okay, you're doing this next year. Um, and yeah. so, and I was listening to it all and I was, well, I was like, one, it's perfect for Divergent Sounds because now Kevin Martinez, our arranger, he can add in like the very like the, the the thing that the Canton Symphony can bring to the table for the Divergent Sounds already mix it with Anthony. Anthony already knows about this part. He's been it before. Before with yeah. Anthony, it's going to be great. But it's it, it's a little different for our Divergent Sounds audience. They're they're used to, and we've had incredible Divergent Sounds musicians, yeah. but they're used to primarily things that are spoken in English. One. <laughs> so this yeah. is going to be weird for people because it's not in English, no, they'll be okay. but they'll, they'll be, be okay, but trust me. the way that you guys do it, like, everyone's yeah. going to be just fine. Um, yeah. but it's just going to be, and yet it's so, it feels modern at the, at the same time as feeling like you said, like it feels like listening to grandma's, like it feels both modern and no, ancient's the wrong word, but it feels, um, yeah. historical and modern very simultaneously, which is so, so, so cool. Um, so I'm really, I'm really pumped about it. I think it's going to be such a fun experience for everyone at the Oracle. And that's, uh, April 4th, April 4th, April 4th, Thursday, yeah, yeah, April yeah. 4th. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really excited. We had our, we had a day. We actually, so Kevin Martinez is a friend of mine and we were on a gig together oh, amazing. when he first started working with Canton Symphony. Like, I remember he was like, I just got this call and like, there's, <laughs> we're going to like do, I'm going to do some arrangements for like from this band that I'm in. So that's super cool. Like to have seen where that started and then like be a part of what's happening now with that. He also did some arrangements for us and we were able to perform 
uh, like seven or eight of our songs with a full orchestra. So like with our full six piece. And so that's part of our um, our next chapter is doing all sorts of yes. like different pop events and different, you know, Italian nights and things like that mm -hmm. with orchestra. And like you said, the music is really conducive to adding the full orchestra sound. I think Anthony writes, it's already kind of innately there. And yet we can bring something for me, the word is rooted. Like it's That's so deeply word. rooted in these traditions. And like, you can hear I, when I lived in Italy for a summer and one of the songs that I brought to the group is called Som Som. And it's, it was a, it's a lullaby that was sung by this choir of farmers so i got to hear them perform in this small village and they're all wearing like overalls like they're wearing work clothes that's their concert dress and it's like great grandfathers grandfathers fathers and sons singing and so i was like so taken with that um and you know brought that to anthony and he of course creates this beautiful sound soundscape with it and so it's just like these that rootedness um of the people and the stories kind of takes everybody and allows for that and then the new sound comes in as well yeah it's going to be really exciting i before we kind of finish our conversation today we I, i'd like to talk about i'd like to talk about improvisation a little bit um and about kind of how you think about improv because I, I i we've we've mentioned it a couple of times and there's a couple of traditions of music where it, it just exists uh, jazz, obviously, is one of them. I was in New Orleans just a little bit ago, so I was around. Preservation Hall is a special place. I don't know if you've ever been to. Pre Have you ever yeah. been? Just last what, year, yeah. What a what a special place to everyone should go to Preservation <laughs> Hall once in their life. Um, what a what a great time that is. Obviously, jazz. Um, obviously, bluegrass. I you know, in a lot of folk traditions, but a lot of people don't even know how to approach improv, especially from classical backgrounds. I think yeah. improv scares. It could t I, I was talking uh, with Melissa, who's the CEO for the American Composers Orchestra. Um, and she, <laughs> she had a composer write a piece for her orchestra that was improv based. Yeah. And she said at the beginning, they all wanted to murder me. Yep. By, but by the end, everyone was having a fun time. But Good, she said, yeah. it's so scary to ask classical musicians to improv uh, because they yeah. look at you like you have two heads. Um, so I'd love to just kind of explore, like, what do you, how do you think about improv and how might improv, if we can convince the classical world at one point to embrace it a little bit more, how might yeah. that help um, our young people become better musicians um, in, in our classical musical traditions? I just, for me, I, I was also one of those people that was scared of improv, like as a, as a pianist who read notes from a very young age and didn't really learn how to play by ear or even have people talk about that. And then, um, starting to sing jazz because I had this, you know, voice that everyone said, you should sing jazz. And I, I happened to be in DC where I was hanging out because they went to the same church as me as the staff director and arranger for the Airmen of Note. His name's Alan Baylock. He's now the head of the University of North Texas jazz program. <laughs> and so he would like bring these like world-class musicians from Airmen of Note to like church on Sunday morning and like do an arrangement and be like, Amanda, just solo. And I like, as a 15 year old kid, I like played cl you know classical piano. I had no idea what to do. And I knew what Ella Fitzgerald sounded like and I loved Sarah Vaughn and I loved, but I didn't know so I thought I was supposed to just go like like that was what I was supposed to do, right? So I just kind of did something and and I know that I it, I felt awful and I felt embarrassed and I'm not sure, I, I'm sure it didn't sound very good. So I, I suffered and struggled with that. Um, and slowly over time, I don't know if there, I, I can't think of an exact moment that was like the switch for me. But slowly over time, as I started getting asked to sing more and more jazz, I think I was like, I have to figure this out. I have to like, people are going to ask me to improvise. So I have to sort this out. And I started to like explore improvisational styles of other traditions. And then I, I came to realize something, something really important. Like I, as a child was just like, jazz is a thing and it's, there's a way to do it and there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And then as I started teaching in, in colleges, I started realizing like, oh, jazz with this was a thing that happened because people were moved to create. 
And then subsequently, we've looked back on that and made decisions about how it's supposed to be. And we've codified it and we've put it like in a book and said, like, this is a bebop scale and this is what Charlie Parker did and this is how this works and this. And I love us. Go academics for doing that. But what that's what that has done for the creative spirits in all of us is give us this this idea that there's one way to do it. And if we don't spend 10 years getting it right, then we shouldn't do it at all. And like my guys in Alabuara, a lot of them come from jazz backgrounds. I mean, you can they have these conversations. We're on the road a lot together. You hear them in the car. They're talking about, you know, these scales and this scale and this this and they know so much because they've put that those 10 years in. But now they're they're letting go into something bigger. And so when I realized that about everything, everything, art, everything has been a movement from a creative muse or a creative spirit that we then look back on and decide and give words to and name. And so I was like, okay, well, improvisation doesn't have to mean scat singing then, right? So I started looking at like, what are people doing and how are, and then I got, I got a grant to be an artist for a year through the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture when they still had their individual artist grants. In 2014, I said, who's doing classical music, jazz, folk, who's improvising? I was like, oh, Bobby McFerrin. So I called up Bobby's people and I'm like, I want to study with Bobby. I have money. I have a grant and they're like he teaches one they're like he teaches one week a year in new york at the time it's in california this year um you can come so i signed up for that and then before that happened they called me and said bobby's doing a bobby meets cleveland tour where he works with local artists can you help us get some singers together that would feel comfortable improvising on stage and so we did this fully free concert with bobby he had one song programmed that he created that he wrote and gave to us and the rest of it was free improv. Um, so that started me opening my mind to, oh, being in community, creating sounds. Now, Bobby's circle singing is amazing. It tends to focus on one person in the middle, kind of creating an experience that everyone participates in. I love that as a part of the portfolio of things. What I'm really interested in is everyone in the circle coming and having an equal participation and an equal voice in the process. So I have developed over years now, one, a spiritual practice of improvisation. I do, music is a job for me. And I sometimes do get into that space where I'm like, I just can't listen to any more music right now because I did it for 12 hours today. Two, in order to combat that and survive, I developed the spiritual practice of improvisation where I put all of it away and sometimes I just sing. I literally just make sounds and it's completely separate from the Amanda that's a soprano that has to get, you know, jobs to sing. And third, I started inviting people in the community um, into that with me. And some of that is through, I do a lot of progressive church and ecumenical um, community building. I do a lot of like worship and bringing together different religions and using global songs to get people singing together. I use a lot of improvisation in that. I use a lot of improvisation with my classical students who have 12,000 degrees and hate singing. And then I say, we're just going to make sounds together. And it's like, oh, I'm like, they're like, oh, my God. I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't matter. Your voice can crack. I'll go with it. I'll, I'll crack my voice, too, because it's part of what we're creating in this moment. So it's giving permission to, like, touch the creative heart that is in all of us that gets lost. So how can we bring it into classical music? All of that. I mean, how amazing would it be to sit in a room with Canton Symphony musicians, particularly ones who wanted to be there? Because, right, like you said, it's hard sometimes for people, like all different personalities. And so sometimes people are like, I will literally die. Do not make me do this. Like, we're going to respect that. We're going to respect that, right? But for those who might be curious to first gain trust by being like, I'm a classical musician, you're classical musicians, we're at a high level, but we're, we're gonna put all of that away right now and we're gonna jam and we're gonna have some fun and we're not even gonna think about it as music, we're gonna think about it as like self-expression and story and light coming into the dark and all, and so how fun would it be to sit around and make sounds with our voices and then bring instruments? And I've developed all these doorways that we can enter. Let's play this poem, let's sing this, poem let's sing this photo 
I'm going to tell you a story and we're going to sing about it. Let's, let's walk around the room and investigate things and then make sounds. And so it's really about, I, I love improvising with the general public. I love improvising with classical musicians. Like, give me a room of classical musicians who have never improvised. Give us two hours. Let's see if we can make some magic and get some sparkles in the eyes. Usually it happens. I, I, I absolutely love, I did a, I did a, I, I've done some things with, um, middle school groups or talks and it, when people come to the symphony and I try to get them to think about mindfulness and music. And we have a lot of mindfulness things here at the symphony. We do stuff at the schools. But, um, one thing I did with a group of middle schoolers and they hated me at the beginning of it. And then they were, then we had a good time. Um, we all just sat in a circle and we closed our eyes and I just said, just hum when you feel like it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it took them. And I said, I said, it's okay. All of our eyes are closed. We don't know who it is. It's okay if you don't like the way, like, just like, I want you to just make some music to show that you are a musician too. Mm -hmm. And it took, oh gosh, they really, it was so scary for them. Oh, it was so yeah. scary for them, but they did it. And it, you know, and it, and we had a good time, but I realized how, if that's scary for a middle schooler, gosh, it's even scarier for an adult because adults have to act a certain way and mm -hmm. randomly humming in a circle is not how you act as an adult. And I always mm -hmm. thought that that was, um, really really interesting and I, I i grew you know again i grew up at music festivals around campfires with people just passing a tune around a circle um yeah. and so that's always felt good to me um and it's always fun I, I, so the walnut valley bluegrass festival is the one i go to and we had what we call it classical corner or it was all the people who were classically trained that found wandered their way to over to our camp and realized that like there was some really interesting music making happening. And then our jazz people would show up and they'd be like, what's happening over here? And I was like, you guys yeah. could jazz, like let's do jazz for a second. And then the traditional bluegrass pickers would be like, oh gosh, we've gotten into some chords that I'm not a fan of anymore. <laughs> and then, it, and, but it was always so fun. My friend Ian is a brilliant jazz musician, old, old, like he is like turn of this, like he knows every song you've ever heard your entire life. Wow. Um, and it just, I just love that tradition. I'm so grateful for you for, for sharing this and having this be a part of your life and what you do, because I just think that this is, this is so much of what I think our classical world needs. And I, I just love, I love it so much. I am so tickled that you love it because I was shunned for it for so long. I've been saying the same things for a long time. It feels really nice to have the world turning a little bit to be interesting in the interested in the healing that's found in expanding around these boxes. It, it always, it, I always get so sad when people didn't grow up going to music festivals or grow up with people who like to have music at their home or just to listen to music, even just listening to music with each other and commenting on it and having opinions. And I, I want that to be a bigger part of our culture. I feel like there's pockets of American culture where that is very much rooted in who people are. But I don't think that popular culture of America, if we're gonna be a wide scope of American culture, that is a practice. I don't think mm -hmm. music is at, at, at much of a core of who Americans are than other places in the world. Um, I think I definitely there's pockets, I think in America, but mm -hmm. I wish that our culture, um, and I've been having lots of conversations about funding and, and, and you know, the, the, the numbers behind everything. But someone said to me, like, we need to think our, our, our music and our art should be infrastructure to us. It, sh it should be integral to a, yeah, it's a, it's integral mm -hmm. to a community happening. Like mm. we walk on the roads every day, we should be in the music every, you know? And I think that that was such a beautiful way of thinking about it. I know infrastructure is not yeah. sexy, right? But we fund it like crazy, right? So we, why, why can't we think about our, our arts like infrastructure and that it being that integral to who we are as people? Um, and I just I would love for that to be who we are. I think that it's one of those things that is not black and white. It's a gift and a challenge that we are such um, a melting pot culture as America. And like, you know, in my travels in the world, when you have ancient cultures like China or Mongolia who have kind of remained insular and untouched, they have a sense of what their art form is. And 
in Cambodia, you know, they had, when I was there in early 2000s, they had just experienced, you know, 20 years before a massive genocide. And so they were just starting to have those conversations of like, how do we bring back the traditional art and music? Because unfortunately, one of the populations of people that were targeted and killed were artists because they didn't want that culture spreading under the Khmer, Khmer um, Rouge regime. So America, we have this, this amazing situation in which we are this melting pot especially our urban centers have such diversity my ch my children's dad is colombian so they you know grow up hearing at you know hearing music of colombia and traditional colombian music but they don't hear that anywhere you know in the streets of you know cleveland um it's one of those beautiful things where we have all of this diversity of tradition and we're i think we're still trying to sort of navigate well wh what where does that leave us as americans where does that leave us? And, 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 you know, bluegrass arrived as a tradition, but also ha is influenced by West African music yeah, from hugely. times of slavery and, um, you know, all sorts of different, even, even native American melodies are found in bluegrass and Appalachian folk music. And so we're in this stage of development, I think, culturally, where we're sort of trying to be respectful and deeply want to be respectful of all of these different cultures and celebrate them as unique. And I'm so glad for that. And I also hope that down the line, we can expand to include all of these things as the beloved community. Um, and American music can look like all of these things. And for me, at the heart of that is just making sounds together and not worrying about is this from this culture or this culture? Because oftentimes when I try to figure that out, like in Alabuada or in my own like global song leadership with groups, you can keep tracing things back and you can see all these different influences. And so we want to simultaneously honor and, and do our best to the integrity of the culture from which something came. And at the same time, expand around that to invite people into that. And so that's what's at the core of, of what I think classical music needs to do. And how, and you asking, how do we orchestrate change? You know, when we were talking in, in emails, it's like, I think it's one person and one event and one conversation and one concert at a time in looking at that expansive experience of music outside of the boxes, outside of the like, we're going to only focus on this one narrow place and if we choose to focus on the one narrow place recognizing that in the context of the larger arc of humanity now before and where we're heading well i have to say uh, i would the i was about to ask the last question how do we orchestrate change but yeah you answered sorry, beautiful. No, no, that was beautiful no not at all you answered it just so 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 beautifully and may I just say, from the bottom of my heart, what an absolute joy it has been to talk with you today. Thank you so much for being here, for being with us, for sharing everything you have. And we cannot wait for our two upcoming, very soon upcoming yeah. collaborations and with you. Listeners of this podcast, um, this will come out before your performance with Divergent Sounds. It will come out after Mozart, but we have over a thousand people already coming to Mozart. So <laughs> they know about that. Okay. So we're I'm, we're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for this conversation today. I'm, I'm so excited to ask you more questions now and to see if there's even more wonderful things we could do together because wow, my brain is, is I'm flooded with ideas. I'm, I'm I'm so ready. So well, amazing. I absolutely love that. And I can tell that you're both like spirit friends um, in music and in the way that you are looking at, you know, how to how to be creative, sort of looking ahead. How do we, you know, innovation? I, I feel like a, a kindredness. So thank you for that. I would welcome and love more conversation. And I'm really excited. I got to tell you, my um, family, my when my dad, when my mom's father immigrated from Romania, they all were based in like the Akron Canton area. So um, I I haven't lived ever in Canton, but like growing up, I heard everybody talking about the Canton family and the Akron family. And so um, coming home in a way to the Canton Symphony just feels really exciting for me because um, it's just a word and a sound that I've heard 
all 42 years of my life talking about Canton. So I'm really excited to meet your people and to be with be um, in the spirit of music with you all and then to turn around after Mozart and then have our Divergent series. I'm really excited. So thank you so much. Soprano Amanda Powell, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a privilege. Thank you both. Orchestrating Change is a production of the Canton Symphony Orchestra. Our theme music was composed by Eric Gould and performed by Derek Snyder and Tim Adams. Our audio engineer and mixer is Nathan Maslick with video and audio editing by Shoreline Media. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.